Hi, I just want to first say thank you so much to NECA and Bianca for being here with us today. I have been looking forward to this since the moment um, that I was asked to do it. As a, a mother of two daughters, a, a daughter, a wife, um, a sister, a friend, these conversations are so important to me. So number one, just thank you. And I know that these 20 minutes are going to go faster than I can imagine. So I'm just going to jump right in with the first question um, for NECA. So, um, you know, the landscape today, um, dec a couple of decades after Title IX, you know, um, was first introduced, um, we've come a long way. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, one of your quotes that I really love is that you've said um, in your work for equity for women, um, it's more than just a game. It's a fight to change the status quo and to give players a part of their share. Can you describe how um, in this current in this current landscape, what that looks like? Sure. First of all, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, Ali and Bianca. Um, you know, I, th I think that to go to my quote, um, that was around the time when we had decided to opt out of um, our current agreement, our collective bargaining agreement. And, you know, there was, there was so much that we knew could change, um, though we didn't quite know how. And I think that that's kind of what was most important. It was understanding that the change needed to happen, the change could happen, and it, and it was in our hands, you know? And, the, and that status quo is something that that can not just affect what's going on now, but more importantly, and what we most realized, for generations to come, for players to come, for women in society, we really wanted to be able to adjust that in a way that is conducive to us as prof prof professional women, conducive to us as women in sport, um, and something that truly reflects our value. And it's not just about implementing, um, I guess you could say, structure and strategy. It's about changing the mindset that adjusts the status quo for it to be able to reflect the excellence that women so often display um, in their parts in society. Hmm. And I love that you talk about how it's you know, the work that's happening now is for generations to come, because just a quick follow-up question, um, in many ways, um, pay equity um, issues are no more visible than in women's sports, because number one, um, the, the women hero athletes have made it their mission to be very vocal and make it visible. And, and also because just quite literally, the gap is so, you know, the figures are so large. Um, but also, I know that there's been a lot of conversation about how the the um, gap is a little bit different um, specific to um, this industry because it has to do with business models as well. So can you also speak to um, how, um, you know, it's going to be up to this generation, the next generations to come to sort of change that business model so that the gap disappears? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you you know, you hit the nail on the head with, you know, decades after Title IX. Without Title IX, I'm not sure if I would be sitting here today talking about these types of things. So, you know, with the times come different fights. Um, but along the way, there's that common thread of kind of being born into it. You know, women in sport are a microcosm of society. You know, it's incredibly reflective of what's going on on a grander scale in society. Um, and naturally, you know, because uh, our existence in society has been politicized, that's most certainly going to carry over no matter what profession you have. And, and to amplify that even more so, as athletes, we have platforms um, that we're seeing being used in more ways than just branding our individual selves. And understanding that we as athletes are a business um, as it pertains to us having partnerships and sponsorships we also have now understood that the business of sport, whatever league you're in, is also a contributing factor to your direct experience, to how, how people are perceiving sport, especially women in sport. And so for us to be able to have a union that can contribute to enhancing that and holding our league accountable and ourselves accountable for the change that we want to see, it's naturally going to get the business going. And then when we're, when we're most authentically ourselves, 
the business will grow because you'll have partnerships and organizations who want to also align with us. And so then the money and the resources flow and we grow from there. And I think right now we're on the precipice of that really kind of erupting. And, it, and it's really exciting to be a part of this time. Mm. And you said, thank you, because you set me up beautifully for the question that I have in mind for Bianca. We had a, a brief casual conversation right before we jumped in. And she was talking about um, uh, in in your in your sport of surfing, um, there's so many nuanced ways to think about um um, you know, negotiating for, you know, equal pay and equal, equal parts, um, of what you deserve in the industry. And that you think that, um, it goes so far beyond just like beyond the, the income gap. Could you speak to a little bit of those things that you were sharing with me, the things that we have to, the nuanced ways, um, specific to your sport that you've been digging in and trying to move the needle, needle forward? Yeah, so in surfing, we've won equal prize money worldwide. Uh, but prize money is really just one tiny piece of athlete compensation. And so we really need to look at the whole picture um, and, and look at how we can update the compensation model. Because everybody is running these content-centric models and asking all the athletes in our sport to, you know, for the content and to ramp up the marketing for, and the data to speak to it, like Kelly was saying. Um, and while we're putting our lives on the line and sending it on huge waves and, you know, snowboarders are hucking themselves over ledges, um, most athletes don't even have health insurance and they certainly don't have a retirement plan. Whereas, the professionals who are the best at what they do worldwide in every other sector are, have all those things. They have retirement plans, maternity leave, health care. They're building equity in stock. So I think there's a better model out there for all athletes when it comes to surfing. Hmm. And then just as a quick follow up, because, um, you know, as you talk about um, needing to bring light to like all of these many um, issues, not having health care when when you're in, in the midst of such a dangerous sport. Um, when was that moment in your in your career when you realized it was going to have to be for you more than just about um, competing, that it was going to be about using your platform to um shine some um, knowledge and light on these issues? Well, I decided I, when I started surfing when I was seven years old, I decided I wanted to be the best surfer in the world. And when I was a teenager, I realized that there wasn't the opportunity to do so if you're a woman. And later on, when I started surfing big waves, it, and it is life and death out there. It really is an equalizing field out there. I'm out there with mostly men and we're colleagues and we're watching out for each other and we're saving each other's lives. And so I started to look at the, the broader scope of, you know, it's not just me who doesn't have health insurance and retirement plan. It's also the guy right next to me. So the, I started using my platform by uniting with three of my best friends. We were able to win equal prize money working with policymakers in, in California. And now um, we're thinking to the next steps and how we can connect with athletes like NECA and in the other sports. And what we all have in common is that we are the drivers in the marketing force and creating these businesses. And so we deserve to be treated like owners. Mm -hmm. And Neka, the same, I, if I could ask you the same question, was there, was there a moment where you realized um, that it was going to, for you, it was going to be more than just, um, you know, being in, you know, competing and then being in business in, in this business, it was going to be also about finding those opportunities to use your platform um, to try to move um, the conversation about uh, the gender gap and other equity issues for women. Sure. You know, I, I think, you know, when in the league, when you enter, you get drafted, there's this <laughs> excitement flurrying around and you really just want to focus on your craft. And as women in uh, basketball, we play 
12 months out of the year most times because we're playing in the WNBA and we're also playing overseas. So um, initially, you know, I was kind of raised on veterans who talked about, you know, going overseas, making as much money as you can with the opportunities that are afforded to us. And I'm now kind of in the in-between of two generations where I've had veterans who told me, stack your cash. And now you have younger players coming in, demanding more of their value from a brand perspective and a business perspective. And I would have to say that kind of halfway through my career so far, I realized that I can have a part in my own value um, that doesn't force me to wreck my body 12 months out of the year. Um, and I, that is that even is a privilege for me because it looks different for every different type of player. Um, but it really hit home when I was elected into the executive committee and ultimately as president of our union um, with the task of figuring out what we wanted to do with our with our last collective bargaining agreement. Um, I, I had experienced over the years hearing so many players complain about player experience, player safety, player health, and most notably, of course, compensation and salary. And I, I think it's important that Bianca speaks about compensation because that truly is a small aspect of things, you know, and in our case, salary and compensation are two very different things. You know, salary is what you make for playing. Compensation is anything additional that you make in partnership with the league um, that comes from the business perspective. And so understanding those intricacies in where I was as a player and also what players demanded and also hearing about their experience historically is where I really found myself in a position to be able to um, use my voice, but most importantly, my ears to hear what players needed because you can't lead without listening. And I've, I've realized in our, in our newly formed seven member executive committee of our union, listening is really what has gotten us to this point. And we have to continue to empower players to use their voice, whether it's internally or externally, to create the change that we want to see. And that's the best way that we can hold ourselves and others accountable. Oh, I love that. As a journalist, I am always telling people to use their written voice, but now I'm going to also remember to tell people to use their ears. I really like that. Um, and Bianca, back over to you. I wanted to ask you, you know, obviously there are, so you, you shared a little bit with us, but um, we don't have time to go into, I, I asked the audience, go and check out what Bianca's done in terms of leadership. She has really moved her industry forward. Um, but can, so I was wondering, would you share with us, like if you, you have this playbook for change, would you sort of share with us what, like, what, what some of those rules are, um, how other business leaders in your industry or outside can take those rules, you know, look at what you've done in the past and, and try and use those for themselves? Yeah. So, um, I think that the playbook is still being written and that we do need to look at how we can update the model and um, and get those resources that we need in order to support the performances and to get move beyond this transactional type of relationship where you win you win a competition or you don't. You get a sponsorship and you help them um, create their marketing and then you retire. You know, you're, you're, you're no longer relevant at a certain point. So I think that once we can move beyond this transactional type of model and um, specifically as a woman, the number of times that we get offered like exposure bucks you know, hey, we just want to use your image so that we can for our for profit entity to make money and you're going to get to be on the side of this building. Um, <laughs> like, I think uh, that's it's it's demoralizing and it's hard. But um, at the same time, it takes so many tiny victories to create a huge change that uh, I, I kind of like NECA said, like I just focus on trying to ride a better wave every day mm -hmm. and stay focused on the waves because that's what fires me up. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I love that you say that. Cause I really, I've been thinking about that a lot this year. I feel like this is the year that, um, in many ways, um, women, people of color, um, society, we've grown up a little, we've become a little less naive to those things where, you know, in the past, 
women and people of color were very um, um, guilty of always volunteering, giving their time up because we believed so much in things. And that is so important. On the other hand, I love that you point back to uh, the fact that your time is valuable and, you know, we're only going to move these conversations forward if, if, if we recognize that. So that sets me up for both of you. I'd love for you both to weigh in on this. I'll start with NECA though. Why, you know, we sit in this room and we hear each other's um, uh, um, experiences and advice. Can you sort of like speak to why and specifically to the, in the sports industry, it's so important to be in a room with another uh, leading athlete from a different industry. Like why are these conversations around equity and and Pay, um, the wage gap so important to have not just the, not just this day but like year round. Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of spoke about this before we hopped on. Um, I was I was talking about how you know what we were doing in the WNBA. We couldn't be ignorant to the fact that things look different in different sports. You know, you can't just completely categorize all women in sport. Um, which often happens even though there's enough detail and care to distinguish what men need in different sports. And so we need to hear each other out. Um, through our CBA negotiations, I was in contact with women's soccer and women's hockey, as I mentioned um, before this call. And I was saying, when I looked at Bianca, I knew nothing about surfing. And 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 I've, I've met some professional surfers and I still don't know um, much about the sport with the exception of obviously what they do, but there's just in what I do, there's so many things people don't know about women's basketball. There's a lot of people that don't know we play overseas, you know? And so if I don't know enough, if I'm not educated enough about the sport itself, it's going to be very difficult for me as a CEO or as a board of governors to know what is needed for these women in surfing women in hockey, you know, women in basketball, it, we can't generalize everything. And it's, imp it's very important for us to start with hearing each other out before we go to larger entities to demand our value and our worth. Mm, I love it. Well said. And Bianca, same question. Why do you think like it's important to be in a room um, with other leaders, um, women who are trying to, you know, move their industry or their, or their sport forward? Yeah, I think it's important because in in one way or another, we're all fighting the same fight. And so what I think we should do is have some kind of a monthly athlete happy hour with all the athletes from the different sports. And um, I think that would be really fun to do NECA with you and soccer players, hockey players. And we just get on and we start to get to know one another and start shooting the breeze. I would love that. And if if in any way I could help facilitate it, I would love to, I would love to also take that on. Um and so how about I've called this my speed round because I know I have two, I have two minutes left. So I want to get this one last question in. Um, again, circling back around to decades past uh, Title IX. There's no, there's no doubt that women um, athletes, young girls, and young college women athletes have are have come so much because of the work done by um, the leaders before us. Um, do you have any tips for you know women um, who want to make their career in? in athletics, you know, how they can, you know, be the change makers that you have been. I'll start with you, Neka. Um, well, I always tell young, young, young aspirers, the first thing to understand is sports is a, it's a, it's a global language. And whether you play it at the little leagues, the T-ball league level, <laughs> or the professional level, an athlete is an athlete. So I, I actually always try my best when people say, oh, I've played before. And I mean, I was only in my middle school team. You played. That's all that matters. You know, I don't think that there's an, an no end game. There's no aspiration. And, and with that, I try to let young women know that you can be involved in sport without having to be on the court, in, in the water, on the course, it you you can you can be in sport with it just having to you being an athlete, and that's where we need women most because if we have women on the court who who have male coaches, male CEOs, male GMs, it's still not being reflected within the organization 
to change what we need to get changed. And so we need more women in executive positions for us to to get the change that we're talking about right now. And I think mm-hmm. that's very important for a lot of people to realize. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, Bianca, for you, same question. Do you have a motto or words of advice for um, the next generation of, you know, women leaders, women athletes coming, you know, up the pipeline to fill this ro- these roles? Yep. So I would say dedicate, don't hesitate. And touching on what Neka was just saying, whether you're a surfer or not, or an athlete or not, every day you can wake up and choose to ride a better wave tomorrow. I love it. Um, thank you so much. I could, I guess, as I said, I could do this for hours, but um, I know we have another panel coming up. So I just want to say thank you so much for being here with me, for, for doing this important work. And I, I'm going to keep my eyes on you because I know there's like so much more change to come. So thank you so much. Thank you.